Welcome everyone to another RIS interview where we bring you the story behind the cutting edge research that made it into our journal, the Review of International Studies, uh, RIS as it's commonly known. Um, today I'm delighted to be talking to Rory Cormack, who is a professor of international relations at the University of Nottingham. Um, Rory, together with Calder Walton, an assistant director of the Belfair Centre's Applied History Project and Intelligent Project at Harvard University, and Damien uh, Van Poivelt, um, a lecturer in intelligence and international security at the University of Glasgow. Um, they have written a, a, an article in the Review of International Studies with the title, What Constitutes Successful Covert Action, Evaluating Unacknowledged Interventionism in Foreign Affairs. Uh, welcome to you, Rory, and congratulations on the article. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me on. Um, so let's get straight into the interview. Um, I wanted to start uh, by asking you um, about your academic journey. Um, you've become a specialist in secret intelligence and covert action, but what led you to become interested in this area of research and, and what brought the three of you together to write the article? It's just really interesting <laughs> is, the, is, is the answer. I, I find this stuff fascinating. Um, it's, it's all around us. We've got just in the last, literally in the last year, we've had um, Russian attempts to interfere in the US presidential election, Iranian attempts to interfere in the US presidential election, Russian attempted assassinations, the Chinese spreading disinformation about COVID-19. We've had Iranian sabotage of Israeli ships. We've had Israeli assass alleged assassinations of Iranian scientists. The list goes on and this this is is so interesting and um the three of us have, have long been interested in the the secret world broadly defined and in terms of this particular article we realized that for all of the great academic research on on covert action there's very little understanding about whether it actually works and the the genesis of the article was was colder and i um were kind of flailing around with it and um we had we ended up recruiting we recruited Damien who uh, who transformed it and helped us helped us sort it out and um sort our thinking out and, and ultimately getting over get over the line with Riz so as a, as a trio we ended up um we ended up working quite well together each bringing different um specialisms I suppose Great. So could you um, tell us a little bit about the article? Could you give us um, a brief outline of its main ideas and arguments? The starting point for the article is we have more and more uh, historical research. And I'm a historian um, by training. We have more and more historical research coming out of the archives, telling us about operations and, and actions, um, particularly in the US, but increasingly in the UK as well and, and, and elsewhere. Um, and international relations scholars are increasingly exploiting this historical research to ask the more IR type questions. Um, what are the causes of covert interventions? Um, what's the impact on democracy, on democratic peace theory? There's a bunch of, bunch of research on this, but there's very little on what constitutes success in the first place particularly given the highly mythologized, highly romanticized nature of covert action. There's been a recent wave of very interesting um, quantitative um, political science analysis using data sets. And, and the three of us are um, respectful, but also a little bit skeptical of taking too much of a, a quantitative approach to what ultimately we argue in the article are subjective judgments. These are stories and narratives of success that have been framed in particular ways which have built up over decades. So what we've done is we've um, tried to develop a, a new way of understanding what constitutes success in the first place and then we apply this um, to a case study and the case study we chose was the so-called golden age of success, the CIA's heyday in the late 1940s um, and 1950s, all the way through until the uh, failure at the Bay of Pigs in 1961, when um, 
the very, very, very notorious example when the CIA tried to invade and overthrow um, Castro in, in, in Cuba, and it went horribly wrong, not least because Castro was uh, fully aware of what was happening uh, and was, was, was ready for, for, the, for the invaders. Um, so there's this, there's this so-called golden age, and it includes the CIA's successful um, attempt to keep the communists out of power in Italy by rigging the Italian elections. It includes the famous example in 1953, when the CIA alongside Britain's own MI6 managed to remove the Iranian prime minister, Mohammad Mossadegh, um, because he was just too nationalist and getting a bit too close to the communists. And it includes the 1954 operation um, where the CIA overthrew the president or sponsored a coup against the president of Guatemala. And these are successes. That's those success. The success there is taken almost as a given. And most of the analysis is about what were the longer term implications of that, about whether it was right for the CIA to do those things, about how it became a success, how you can ensure these things are a success. No one's really questioning, actually, was it a success? Why are we taking that for granted? Um, so we unpack this case study and look at how um, that narrative of success has built up over, over decades, looking at um, you know, the sources available, looking at the framing of those sources, looking at the, the characters. We draw on um, a little bit of the narrative turn in foreign policy, bit of um, interpretivism, just to look at how this became a success. And our argument basically is that it's very difficult to understand success in covert action, and not just because of the secrecy. Obviously, covert action is shadowy, it's secretive, it's mythologized, which makes it really, really interesting. But that's only half the problem in working out, does this work? Uh, and the other half of the problem is it's really interesting because it's, it's kind of intangible because covert action exists to nudge other forces along it exists to sponsor internal dissidents rebel groups um opposition politicians how can we know that the covert action was instrumental in achieving these things how do we know that the election wouldn't have been won anyway that the coup wouldn't have happened anyway so you get into this world of counterfactuals, which, which, which we think makes covert action just so fascinating and intriguing. And also it works alongside overt, you know, tra traditional foreign policy, economic policy, uh, military threats. So again, how can we pinpoint the fact that it's the covert action which is making all the difference? So ultimately, we argue that covert action is successful when salient observers, when influential people say it's successful. And when that judgment becomes a dominant narrative, when it sticks, um, that's, 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 that's the crux of our argument, really. So you've, I think you've already answered this partially, but you may want to add some more. I, I was just wondering why um, covert action is so difficult to evaluate. Um... Well, first of all, a few things. One, it's secret uh, and, and highly classified. The Americans, to be fair, are relatively transparent. Um, they've declassified around 50 operations. Um, the Brits, <laughs> less so, and other countries, even less so. Um, so it's difficult to, to know this study. And obviously, the, the more contemporary things that we see all around us today, they were still very highly, highly uh, classified. Um, so it, it, is, it is secret. But it's also... It's also difficult to pin down. It's not uh, it's difficult to create data sets, I would argue. How do you know when a covert operation begins or ends? Take the Iranian coup in 1953, for example, a very famous case study of, of covert action. Um, when did it start? Does it start when the Americans gave a green light in spring? Did it start when Britain started to overthrow the same government back in also 1951. Um, and, and where does it end? The Italian elections, another example. Uh, the, the CIA successfully 
um, kept the communists out of power, but then carried on covertly giving money to the government for, for decades afterwards. Is that one operation? Is that 10 operations? It's very difficult to quantify, I think, which makes it difficult to then come up with, with success. It's also difficult because, as we said earlier, um, it works alongside internal forces and it works alongside foreign policy. Um, how do we pinpoint, how do we isolate that success? And then finally, um, it's difficult to judge success because how do we judge the longer term consequences of that covert action? This is a, a big, quite controversial issue. Um, you could argue, and people do argue, taking the 53 coup again as an example, that the covert action led to the 1979 Islamic Revolution and all of the problems for America and the West that, that, that come from that. Um, other people say, well, actually, no, that's, that's counterfactuals. You can't prove it. And besides, surely it's better to have 25 odd years of peace and stability at the height of the Cold War. And that's worth whatever may or may not be ascribed to um, the long term effects of covert action. So it's, it's so much so, so much is subjective, so much is mythologized, there's so many stories going on that it's very, very difficult to quantify or objectively say this was a success. Okay, so for so why are people on both sides uh, so quick to point the hidden hand and see covert action success? <laughs> this surprised us. This is one of the this is one of the interesting, more interesting things that came out of the article, which um, there are different dimensions of success. You have the success of did it meet its goals? And then you have other more, uh, less tangible success about um, was it the right thing to do? What were the political consequences? But if we focus on that first type, um, did it meet its goals? Which seems to be the most easy to, to judge, but it's still for reasons we've discussed. Uh, difficult. Oh, and the goals are vague as well. The goals shift and they move, so it's quite hard to pin it, um, to, to pin a set of goals that you can then judge the covert action against. Um, but what surprised us was that proponents of the CIA, advocates of the CIA, are very quick to say it worked. The CIA worked, and that's because um, a lot of the files that we use are from the CIA, so we only get that one side of the story. Uh, because a lot of our understanding comes from memoirs of the people involved, particularly um, from the CIA. So again, you get that, that, that sense that we wanted X to be done, X happened, therefore, sorry, we, want, we wanted it to happen, um, it happened, therefore we caused it. And it, become, it becomes almost uh, unquestioned. Um, on the, what's inter interesting on the other hand, on the other side, was that the targets were also very quick to point to CIA power and potency. And one of the reasons for this is because it creates a useful scapegoat for their own internal problems and divisions. Take the Italian left, for example, um, not the most effective um, political force in, in Italy for the second half of the 20th century, and very, very happy to blame the CIA meddling uh, as an excuse for that. Um, and the same in Iran, you see a range of different actors from um, monarchists, um, secularists, Islamist fundamentalists, all kind of very quickly saying, it's the CIA, it's the CIA are behind everything that's wrong in our country. No, we're not writing this article to excuse things the CIA did around the world. Of course we're not. Um, but what's interesting is how different audiences perceive it and the, the, the scapegoating, the paranoia, which can sometimes um, come to it, come from it. So you have two different sides. You have the sponsor and the target. And both, for their own reasons, are very quick to collude in this narrative of a potent and powerful CIA that can meddle, manipulate and change things almost at will. And this generates the myth of, of the powerful uh, of the powerful CIA. Now those narratives start to diverge when you start asking what are the consequences of this and was it right, was it excessive, did it undermine democracy, then they start to diverge. But that fundamental question, did the CIA successfully manipulate, 
there is a wide range of agreement that the answer is yes. Great. Okay. Well, um, for those who are listening to this interview, who have, um, you know, you've, you've, um, you've, it's been so interesting, and and you, they, they may be keen to learn more. Um, what would you say are the main takeaways of the article? Takeaway one is, <clears throat> excuse me. Takeaway one is that um, covert action is an important part of international relations. It's under theorized and we need to know more about it. This is not just stuff that gen generates clickbait because it's interesting um, and interesting stories about assassinations and bombs and disinformation and all this kind of stuff, which is fascinating, but it's also a very important part of international relations and we need to understand if it works. Um, second takeaway is that it's very difficult to answer that question objectively and, and quantitatively. It's all about how narratives of success have, have built up. And third takeaway, and I think the, the, the biggest, because for me, this isn't just a theoretical argument. It has real, real world applications. And if we take the, the, the current um, Russia, uh, Russia issue as, as an example, um, how we respond, how we perceive the success or otherwise of Russian attempts to divide the West, to undermine our faith in Western liberal democracy is almost as important as the Russian operations themselves. How we perceive them really matters. Um, many of these operations are a bit rubbish. They're a bit blunt and they don't have that much effect. The problem is when we talk about them and talk them up in the words of one recent MI6 chief, when we big up the Russians, we do their work for them. And many of these covert actions, because they, they don't exist in a vacuum, when we overplay the success of the hidden hand, we breathe oxygen, we breathe new life into what might have been a pretty weak operation. But because we're all talking about, oh, Russia, oh, disinformation, oh, they're meddling, um, it kind of, delegitimize it, it masks over our own problems it means that we're not getting our own house in order and by we i mean us and, and the americans we can't just say oh the, the russians are behind all of this all of this polarization they're not they're exploiting it but they're not causing it um, so we need to get our house in order rather than just blaming everyone else um, and by talking up russia it makes those operations more effective and that's one of the key takeaways the key policy applications uh, implications of the article is that how we respond to covert actions and rumors of covert actions is actually fundamentally important in the impact those covert actions have that's great, Rory. Thank you. I mean, I think that for those listening, I, I would have thought they would they would love to go and read the article after everything that you said. So um, thank you very much for being interviewed. Um, it's a, obviously a very fascinating subject and we're very grateful uh, to you for giving us a glimpse um, into the research that you've been conducting. Um, for those of you who are keen to learn more, you can read uh, the full article on the First View section of the RIS website. Um, if you're a BISA member, you can access this free of charge. Um, it's part of your membership. You need to log, just log into your account. Um, and if you're not a Visa member, you may be able to gain access via your institution. Um, and while you're here, please do look at our website, the Visa website, which is www.visa.ac.uk. Uh, you can learn more about us and see all the wonderful benefits a Visa membership um, can bring you. Um, so uh, that's it from us. Thank you very much um, again, Rory. Thanks for having me. It's an absolute pleasure. Thank you and goodbye. Bye bye.